Welcome. We're delighted to have all of you here today. Um, my name is Penny Wright, and uh, on behalf of all of us at the Rogers Memorial Library, we're really just couldn't be more pleased with the turnout for today's guest, Helen Simonson. I just want to mention that um, um, we have a lot going on at the library. Some of you are out of district, you have told me. So we have a few copies, not many, of our newsletter. We also have July and August calendars. Please take one. And we invite you to join us for any of the programs we do. You can look online at our website. Um, so we hope we'll see you again. If you'd like to get a copy of our newsletter mailed to you every two months, become a friend of the library. You can pay what you want, and it's a really great way to support our programs, uh, principally concerts in our case, and uh, find out what's going on. Um, in 2010, we heard about a woman who had studied at the Southampton Stony Brook Writers Conference who then just went on to become a, a real star, and that was Helen Simonson. She published her first book in her young 40s, and this book went on to become a New York Times bestseller, which many of us read and loved. And I think we had some book discussions with the Rogers Memorial Library reference librarians right here. And was it one of you who even told me that one? Or I, I can't remember how, but we were all involved in in, in being delighted about your first book, Helen. And we were really pleased to see that you've written a second one. For those of you who don't know much about Helen, um, she was born in England and spent her teenage years in a small village near Rye, East Sussex. A graduate of the London School of Economics. Did she listen to their advice about becoming a writer? I don't think so. <laughs> She has spent the last three decades in the U.S. and currently lives in Brooklyn. She is married with two grown sons. Her debut novel, Major Pettigrew's Last Stand, was a New York Times bestseller and was translated and published in 21 countries. I want to thank William from Southampton Books, our new local bookstore, for bringing copies of her books to sell. Thanks for being here. It's an honor to have you here, Helen Simonson. Please welcome Helen Simonson. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, sorry if I was late and made you all stand in the hall. I'd like to blame it on the traffic, but actually I flew to Rye in East Sussex for the weekend um, and only got back yesterday in time to go straight to the Southampton College to appear at the Writers' Conference. And then go home and sleep and get up and come here. So this morning it was sort of like getting myself to move. It was like start trying to move an elderly relative along. So, come on, Helen, I think you should put on your trousers if we're going to Southampton. You know, okay, Helen. Can I just have a cup of coffee? So, um, yeah, so sort of, where are my car keys? Where is the car? How do I drive? So the jet lag is definitely kicking in, but I'll try and stay awake. Um, I was asked last minute to come to England to appear in a documentary about the writers of Rye. So I have more than achieved my life's ambition, which was initially just to be included in the Rye Bookshop on the little shelf called Local Writers. <laughs> now the Local Writers, by the way, begin with Henry James, and Radcliffe Hall, and E.F. Benson. So I was trying to sort of sneak my way into this very good company, but now I'm to be on the television um, with these same writers, so I'm sure they're all uh, turning in their graves as thought. <laughs> And to be fair, actually my position on the uh, bookshelf in Rye is just below Henry James next to an animated children's series called Captain Pugwash. <laughs> <laughs> Captain Pugwash is a bit of a pirate, so, so I guess I'm in the right place. But uh, anyway, so I spent a wonderful day Monday um, roaming the streets of Rye with Damien Barr, who writes a column for the London Times and is the host of this documentary, sort of uh, walking and talking uh, about my book and about Rye and all the writers who came before me. And um, so sort of I 
15, 15 minutes, one day of celebrity, it was very exciting. Um, and then here I am, sort of back in ordinary life. Um, but I get to come here. Um, so um, thank you all who are fans of Major Pettigrew's Last Stand. You had me here to talk when that book came out. <laughs> that man has some legs. He's been all around the world. And everywhere I've been on book tour with my second book, sort of the Pettigrew army has come out to support me. So uh, I really appreciate that. Um, that. The success of that book was a complete shock to me uh, and to my family. Uh, and you sort of realize, well, of course Mum goes to writing class at Southampton, but uh, Mum does writing class on Wednesday nights and she does Pilates on Thursdays and maybe there's book group once a month. But um, she wasn't expected to amount to anything. So, in fact, my son sort of didn't recognize what I'd done um, until about three or four months after Pettigrew had been on the bestseller list and um, a film director whose name they knew because he makes sort of mostly very exclusive movies uh, called during the dinner hour to see about optioning it. And I came down to dinner very proudly, told the family. My older son looked at my youngest son and said, oh my God, Jamie, Mom wrote a book. <laughs> <laughs> and now this book came out. We had a launch party in Brooklyn and my youngest son um, is now 21 and was so legally partaking of the cocktails at this very fancy little speakeasy bar in Brooklyn. Um, and my husband gave a little speech. And when we came home, my son was like, oh my God, Dad, it's like, you know, there were all these people there and they were all like clapping for Mom. And it's like, Mom wrote a book. It's like, no way, I can't even use that because it's the same line from before. But uh, I guess your children keep you grounded. But, Having had success with the first book, then everybody looks at you and sort of cocks their head to the side and says, ah, oh, but what are you going to do for a second book? Um, though, so there's some pressure, though. A relative of mine um, at a wedding last year, before the book came out, told me that I should feel no pressure about my second book because, as he said, Helen, everybody knows second books tank. <laughs> 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 So, they do, right? They're just a sophomore. I could look forward to the sophomore slump, but he was sure I would come back strong with a third. Um, so when faced with a second novel, uh, what is one to do? My first novel um, had been done at the Writers' Conference and then as part of the MFA program here at Southampton College. Um, and so I had had the support of workshops and I had had wonderful Bob Reeves work as my thesis advisor and I've been through thesis committee. People like Roger Rosenblatt had read and corrected my manuscript. Um, but for the second book, everybody sort of looked at me like, well, now you, you're a professional and you know what you're doing. And so I sort of had to retire to my sort of, sort of little hole in the ground and all by myself write a second book. So uh, the only thing I could think of to do was to go bigger. So um, instead of one narrative voice, which I had in Major Pettigrew, there are sort of three characters in this book telling the story. Um, and instead of just comedy of manners in a small English village, this village is under the threat of war. Um, so that was a challenge. Could I take social comedy and apply it to war? Uh, and thirdly, and maybe I didn't quite understand what I was taking on, um, but I thought I would just sort of time travel from 1914 where I could like hang out with Henry James. But it turned out that was, was uh, actually writing a historic novel, which meant I had to do research. Um, that's real work. So it was rather a shock to find myself sort of in the New York Public Library, the one with the lions, having an appointment with a head research librarian and sort of stammering out my plan for the book and having her pull bibliographies and she had taken the liberty of already printing out sheets of fashion from Collier's magazine and things like this. And then I got to sit in the library with all these books around me and my little glasses on the end of my nose, sort of, I hope everybody thinks I'm doing a PhD. <laughs> um, I found that actually historical research, and I was researching the whole time I was writing this book, which is about five years. So there must be about two years of solid research in this book, but um, research is a wonderful form of procrastination. <laughs> if you're doing real work in the library, you never have to face the blank page. Um, of course, eventually, eventually, you have to 
um, put that put that aside and start writing your story. Um, but just to say, my favorite research experience was actually I got to go to the British Library's periodical section, which is um, in Collindale, in outside London, in the north London. And um, there they give you a beautiful mahogany slanted desk, and they bring you original newspapers and magazines from 1914 in enormous leather books. And you can actually read the Lady magazine or Country Life as my matriarch Agatha Kent would read them coming into her home every week. So I could actually be a woman in 1914. Um, and of course, the war is not telegraphed on the front pages of magazines as it was in the London Times. But you could see it come through. There was uh, suddenly a recipe for economical Christmas pudding and a column of advice, how to speak to the servants about the fact that there wouldn't be a meat course at supper any longer. Uh, and then finally, in the social columns, uh, the engagements and marriages began to be replaced with the words, was to have been married. Because the flower of Britain's young aristocracy began to fall in the trenches um, along with men of every class. So that was sort of devastating uh, as that column changed uh, over the months. So, so that was fun. Um, but of course, yes, eventually I had to put it aside um, and write the book. Um, so for those of you who haven't read it, this uh, book is about a young Latin teacher uh, who comes to town. She um, comes from a sort of aristocratic family, but her, her father was disowned by his family for the grave, grave moral sin of marrying an American. <laughs> And uh, so she's used to sort of traveling the world with her father and has been acting as his secretary um, and as her father's daughter has sort of left, led this life of great bohemian freedom. But when he's dying, he takes her home to his aristocratic family and sort of trades away her future for the chance to be welcomed back by them. Um, you know, for his last day. So she finds herself with her money tied up in trust um, she won't get it unless she marries. Um, and she sort of escapes to Rye and takes a big social step down to become a teacher. Meanwhile, in Rye, they're expecting perhaps a more dowdy, more elderly spinster. Um, and she's been hired to teach Latin, which, as we all know, is a proper subject and therefore should be taught by a man. So uh, not everybody is waiting to welcome her. Um, but she is welcomed by Agatha Kent, who's a town matriarch. Um, who serves on sort of every committee in town and generally runs things. Um, I see a few Agatha Kent's in the room as we speak. <laughs> you know of which I speak here. Um, but Agatha Kent has sort of gone out on a progressive limb here by pushing for the appointment of this young woman. Um, and so I thought it would be really interesting to have Agatha, who works within the confines of a long marriage and within the society of the town, and Beatrice, who's very much an outsider and fiercely independent um, and has declared herself a spinster, um, to see how these two women would work together. Um, and then, of course, looming over it all is the threat of war. I was inspired by Henry James, who stood on the ramparts of my hometown, and he wrote an essay about how he looked across the channel and he thought about the American Civil War. And he had been a young man when it broke out. And he remembered the patriotism and he remembered how grim that war had become. become. Um, and it seemed to him that he knew what was coming when everybody around him was just enjoying their summer afternoon. Um, so the fact that someone like Henry James would be writing about my high street and um, this great conflict that was coming, um, I had found absolutely riveting. Um, and so I know, and you know, as you begin reading the book, that all the fun garden parties and all the gossips and all the people striving for social prominence in the town, they're really going to have to reconsider when the war comes. And that's what the book is about. When what you think you want and what your dreams and ambitions are and how that changes or doesn't change when it's really put to the test, when something as grave as war comes along, what really remains, um, what's important, and what's destroyed by the war and what's sort of burnished in the fire. Um, very serious. But it's really, for me, it's like, can I take a comedy of manners and can I sort of add serious to it and will it stretch? Um, humor has always been used to describe the absurdities of war. Um, I suggest MASH as an example. Um, and um, 
in Britain. Um, the jet lag still kicking in. Monty Python, Monty Python. <laughs> Sorry, the name just slipped away there. Um, Monty Python on YouTube. If you haven't seen them, you can look in Monty Python World War One. Some amazing skits um, about going over the top and the trenches and things. So it had always it's always been used, and I wondered if uh, sort of a more Austin-esque comedy of manners could also be used to describe the horrors of war. So um, you all have to let me know how I did, but really I wanted to make you fall in love with all my characters, and then by the end of the book, um, I wanted to sort of break your heart. <laughs> so, what I thought I might do, if it's okay with you, I'll just read a couple of pages yeah. so you can sort of hear it in yeah. my voice, and then hopefully we can get a discussion going. Um, I'm reading from, this is an advanced copy of the British version, so this is my British cover. I brought it because I thought you'd like to see it, but I actually brought it because it's lighter than the American hardback, and this is what I took with me to the UK, and when I came straight out here, I realized I didn't have my other copy. Um, so I'm just going to read a couple of pages. Oh, and by the way, it's very funny in England because on the tour here, I'm used to saying I'll read a couple of pages in my voice. Well, to British people, I have a sort of hideous American accent. So, <laughs> so after the first time I said that and everybody looked puzzled, I had to change my spiel to say, and if you'll excuse the accent, I'll just read a couple of pages in my voice. Uh, my mother calls me the dreadful yank. <laughs> in an affectionate way. <laughs> the town of Rye rose from the flat marshes like an island, its tumbled pyramid of red tiled roofs glowing in the slanting evening light. The high Sussex bluffs were a massive unbroken line of shadow from east to west. The fields breezed out the heat of the day, and the sea was a sheet of hammered pewter. Standing at the tall French windows, Hugh Grange held his breath in a vain attempt to suspend the moment in time, as he used to do when he was a little boy, in the same slightly shabby drawing room, and the lighting of the lamps had been the signal for his aunt to send him to bed. He smiled now to think of how long and late those summer evenings had run, and how he had always complained bitterly until he was allowed to stay up well beyond bedtime. Small boys, he now knew, were inveterate fraudsters, and begged, pleaded, and cajoled for added rights and treats with innocent eyes and black hearts. The three boys his aunt had asked him to tutor this summer had relieved him of half a sovereign and most of his books before he realized that they were neither as hungry as their size proposed nor had any interest in Ivanhoe except for what it might bring when flogged to the man with a second-hand bookstore in the town market. He held no grudge. Instead, he admired their ferret wits and held some small dream that his brief teaching and example might turn sharpness into some intellectual curiosity by the time the grammar school began again. The door to the drawing room was opened with a robust hand, and Hugh's cousin Daniel stood back with a mock bow to allow their Aunt Agatha to pass into the room. Aunt Agatha says there isn't going to be a war, said Daniel, coming in behind her and laughing. And so of course there won't be. They would never dream of defying her. <laughs> Aunt Agatha tried to look severe, but only managed to cross her eyes and almost stumbled into a side table due to the sudden blurring of her vision. That isn't what I said at all, she said, trying to secure her long embroidered scarf, an effort as futile as resting a flat kite on a, on a round boulder, thought Hugh, as the scarf immediately began to slide sideways again. Aunt Agatha was still a handsome woman at 45, but she was inclined to stoutness and had very few sharp planes on which to drape her clothing. Tonight's dinner dress in slippery chiffon possessed a deep sloppy neckline and long oriental sleeves. Hugh hoped it would maintain its dignity through dinner. <laughs> what does Uncle John say, asked Hugh, stepping to a tray of decanters to pour his aunt her usual glass of Madeira. No chance he's coming down this evening? I'm skipping. It's not until you read that you realize all the paragraphs you could do without that you've actually written a novella. <laughs> <laughs> Your uncle says they're all working feverishly to smooth things over before everyone's summer holiday, said his aunt. He tells me nothing, of course, but the Prime Minister and the Foreign Secretary spent much of the day closeted with the King. Uncle John was a senior official in the Foreign Office, and the usually sleepy summer precincts of Whitehall had been crammed with busy civil servants, politicians, and generals since the Archduke's assassination in Sarajevo. Anyway, he telephoned to say he met the school teacher and transferred her to Charing Cross to catch the last train, so she'll be getting in after dinner. We'll give her a late supper. 
At such a late hour, wouldn't it be kinder to deliver her to her rooms in town and maybe have Cook send down something cold, said Daniel, ignoring Hugh's proffered dry sherry and pouring a glass of Uncle John's best whiskey. I'm sure she'll be horribly fagged and not up to a room full of people in evening dress. He tried to keep a neutral face, but Hugh detected a slight moo of distaste at the thought of entertaining the new school teacher his aunt had found. Since graduating from Balliol in June, Daniel had spent the first few weeks of the summer in Italy as the guest of an aristocratic college chum, and had developed a sense of social superiority that Hugh was dying to see Aunt Agatha knock out of his silly head. Instead, Agatha had been patient, saying, oh, let him have his taste of the high life. Don't you think his heart will be broken soon enough? When Daniel goes into the foreign office this autumn, as your Uncle John has taken such pains to arrange, I'm sure his friend will drop him in an instant. Let him have his little hour of glamour. Thank you. <laughs> So now I'd like to take questions, and I'm moving the microphone because I've been speaking only to the people over here, because when I can't hear you, so I apologize if I swing it round. So please, it's the worst thing for an author when you are called for questions and you're left hanging, and I should say the Canadians are the worst. They're so polite and waiting for somebody else that the first time I spoke in Canada, I was in the parking lot and had to be retrieved for questions. Yes. I was so interested in the names that you use, that they're um, fascinating and particularly killing them. Oh, Miss Tillingham. <laughs> it's not giving away too much. Um, Mr. Tillingham um, is sort of a scurrilous, fictionalized version of Henry James. Um, and his name, Tillingham, I got from uh, E.F. Benson, who sort of owns my hometown of Rye with his Mac and Lucia series. Um, and so it's both an homage to him because he calls Rye the town of Tilling. Um, and it's a signal that I'm coming for him because he's owned Rye for long enough and now I want to stake my claim too. Um, but yes, Mr. Tillingham, um, by making him a fictional character, I could do, uh, I could use all my research into Henry James because I do love the man, but he was terribly curmudgeonly. And I could sort of exaggerate and make him um, as scurrilous as I wanted um, without fear that there will be an angry mob of Henry James fans coming after me. Uh, and they are an angry mob. In fact, my review in the New York Times, since I write comedy of manners, for some inexplicable reason, the Times gave my review to Miss Manners, the etiquette expert, and I guess she loves Henry James, and so she was horrified at my portrait of him as such a cranky man. Um, perhaps she hasn't read his letters, because he was a very commercially man, especially about young women who wanted to write. And so in the book, Mr. Tillingham says that there's sort of a rash of young American women wanting to write, and when he gets these sort of rather purple manuscripts, he has his secretary consign them to the kitchen fire. And uh, even my editor thought that was harsh, but I sort of showed her the Henry James letter in which he suggested, you know, just such a disposition of female manuscripts. Um, but I was saying earlier, I think, that generally I have a hard time with names. Um, if I could write every man I will go with thee, I would, I would do that. And so uh, I got myself into trouble because this is a big book and I have called everybody Mr. Smith. Um, and then you can't really do find and replace too easily with that. So I had to go page by page and, and sort out people's real names. Because really Mr. Smith was sort of sitting in the bar with Mr. Smith discussing Mr. Smith. Um, and so I'm going to have the hardest time. Names are so freighted. Uh, my heroine Beatrice is sort of a nod to Dante. That seemed like a, a good name for a tall, strong woman. Um, but sort of beyond that, I was I was stumped. And if, for some of my minor characters, it's been commented that they have sort of Dickensian names, um, and I think that's true. <laughs> When all else fails, um, open your Mr. Pickwick's papers and start pulling out names and changing them slightly. Yeah. More questions? Yes. All right, so we know you didn't publish this book until you are in your 40s. What kind of writing did you do before? Had you loved to read and write as a child? What sort of writing did you do? Thank you. Um, I think to be a writer, you first and foremost have to be a great reader. Um, I understand there are people who, in the world who like to write poetry but don't ever read a poem. 
you know, that seems incomprehensible for me. So I was a I was a person who was raised basically at the library. My middle class parents didn't have much money, um, and so and the library is free to all. And so every Saturday we were down the library, and every Saturday my sister and I would get out the maximum children's books allowed, and then we would come home sort of spread them out on the floor. Um, and we actually, I think this is even more important, while we were picking our books, my parents were picking theirs. So they were modeling reading. And the, perhaps one of the greatest things my mother ever did for me is well, I sort of ran out of books in the children's section early. And um, she had to sign a form and give permission for me to be allowed access to the adult section um, at a very young age. So. Tend to probably horrified at what I came home with, but <laughs> so I, I was a great reader, and I really loved to write, sort of in high school. Um, but I'd say my parents are middle class, but there's not much money around, so they really thought, since I was academically inclined, that I should get a proper degree and a proper job and write on the weekends. And so, of course, when you do that, you never write on the weekends. So I got an economics degree and went into advertising. And I really sort of put aside, I mean, I always did writing. I, I spent a year as an advertising copywriter um, and always found writing easy. But it wasn't until I was a stay-at-home mom, uh, desperate to sort of get out of the house. And one day I met a friend and I asked him what he was doing for vacation. And he said he was staying home to write his screenplay. And I said, but you're an accountant. And um, he was most upset. And I went home most upset and I realized that I put writers on such a pedestal, and they are put on a pedestal, certainly in England. They're sort of born whole and then sent off for an English degree at Oxford. So if that's not you, you shouldn't write, because you'll be consigned to the kitchen fire. Um, and I realized, I think, that this was America, and as the New York Lottery used to say, everyone has a dollar and a dream. And the very next day, I signed up for beginner fiction at the 92nd Street Y. Um, and it was a revelation. The first week, I was like, oh, I'm home. This is what I'm supposed to do. So I had a plan. My children were still in diapers. I would spend a year writing stories for The New Yorker just to test the theory that I could be a writer. <laughs> that didn't go so well. And then um, I would spend a year writing a novel. Well, my children were in high school by the time Major Pettigrew was published. So um, it didn't go according to plan. But once you start writing, it's very difficult to give it up. Uh, it's very, very addictive. So if any of you are writers, I urge you to just uh, keep doing it. Because eventually, it seems, you know, good work will find a home. But, uh, but, but above all, I think writers are great readers. Yes? You spoke about Major Pettigrew being made into a film. Did that ever come to fruition? Uh, well, the wheels of Hollywood grind slowly. Uh, my husband says um, it will take so long to make Major Pettigrew into a movie that Daniel Radcliffe can play the major. <laughs> but um, actually, my movie producers, the option, they still have the option, and um, they're currently uh, in some level of development to make a series with BBC. So I think that would be very exciting, but uh, I've learned to just keep taking the option checks and let them do what they want. <laughs> But perhaps if I'm if I'm on TV in England in the fall, um, perhaps that will spur things forward. Who knows? So, <laughs> yes. How much is autobiographical? Absolutely nothing. Um, <laughs> I, I was at the Southampton conference last night, and um, there were a bunch of memoirists there. And I had to say that sort of, you know, memoir is my least favorite category. You sort of put all your friends and relatives in a tumbrel, and then you walk them on a parade of shame through the streets. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I feel about memoirs. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm the wrong good ones out there. Yeah. Um, but. I actually, what I really like to do, I just like to sit quietly and have my characters walk into my head by themselves and they are people I don't know and they arrive three-dimensionally and um, it's sort of great to meet these new people. Um, if ever I start writing something that sounds too much like somebody I know, I will sort of, sort of zigzag <laughs> to get out from that. I have absolutely no interest um, in doing that, except I would say in the case of Henry James. I mean. And perhaps it's because you know Henry James is gone from us, so this was my opportunity to sort of resurrect him and enjoy him as a three-dimensional person. Um, you know, in person he would never have invited me to tea, but in my book, <laughs> Mr. Tillingham could invite Beatrice to tea, and I could sort of go along. Uh, but that was a first for me 
doing um, doing a character that was based on something. Yes. But your story is based in Rye, which is autobiographical because you were raised there. Very so true. So the town and the landscape of Sussex has appeared in both my books, um, and that sort of that's very. That's very grounding for me. It gives me an anchor um, from which I can then sort of take flight uh, into fancy. Um, so yes, the um, the town of Rye. And, you know, there was a question in this book: Should I name the town Rye, which is its name, or should I give it a fictional name? Which, if you give something a fictional name, then it covers you. You can put buildings in the wrong places. So if it was interesting this time around, Major Pedro lived in a fictional village in Rye. I was always very conscious of well, if they go to the hotel which has a ballroom, is the ho does the hotel have a ballroom? I took some liberties, but it was definitely interesting and somewhat confining. Um, to be writing uh, about a real place. But yes, I guess the town of Rye um, is very much an autobiographical star, but I can't really hurt his feelings, so <laughs> it was okay to do. Yes? What took Henry James to Rye? Ah. Why was he in Rye? Well, Henry James, I think, was looking for um, a place in the country uh, where he could get away from things and perhaps have a sanctuary to write. And, um, you know, Rye's a pretty fancy little town now, but I think. I'm actually at Rise at the sort of less expensive end of Sussex, and it's much less expensive than the Cotswolds, or where all the society people go. And so, and it has a good train line to London. So it's funny, all these sort of famous riders who live in these cute places at the time, most of them chose those places because they were cheap. So I think there was a certain level of cheap to Rye that allowed him to go down and, and afford this house. Um, but I think also Henry James, um, his celebrity and being an American allowed him to move in very high circles in London. Um, but still, if there were sort of fancy parties run by the Duchess or whatever, he might still find himself seated below the salt because, you know, aristocratic rankings would make him a total commoner. But coming to somewhere like Rye, he was this sort of internationally famous author and um, he was sort of the biggest man in town. Um, so at least I scurrilously imagined um, mm -hmm. that that had something to do with it. Uh, it is a very pretty town, and it's very iconic. It's almost a Mont Saint Michel. It's uh, it's on a little hill, and it's surrounded by flat marshes. So it does look like a little island, um, and it's very very beautiful. I know when I go back, I will, and I was back this weekend. Um, I'm always super thrilled and happy, and I just can't stop looking at the sort of weathered red tile roofs and Elizabethan cottages where the doors are this high off the ground. Um, the man who was interviewing me, Damien Carr, um, they took film of him standing and his head was in the second story of a house. <laughs> um, I mean, it's absolutely beautiful. So beauty uh, and affordability, um, I, I think, and accessibility because you want to have this sanctuary but you want to make sure your other writer friends can come and visit so you can't go too far. But he was there for, for se several decades and then when the war broke out, um, he had to super quick become a British citizen because if you were a foreigner, you weren't allowed to live within 15 miles of the coast. So he actually became a British citizen. I have another question. Um, has having written these two books reconnected you with, with people from your past or have you reconnected with English? friends from the past, or are people surprised that you did this? How is it? <laughs> well, this would be typical. Major Pettigrew came out and a friend texted me, I heard you on NPR and I nearly drove into a ditch. <laughs> <laughs> so, I guess I have reconnected with people. The most amazing thing is I didn't realize anybody read the acknowledgement section at the back of books. And with Major Pettigrew, I thought, well, I may only get one chance at this, so I have extensive acknowledgements. And uh, what was astonishing and wonderful is people who knew my parents and my in-laws 20, 30 years ago got in touch with them because they saw their names in the back. And so for my parents and my husband's parents, they were just thrilled to reconnect with people who they had lost touch with sort of before the digital age um, and had no idea how to get back in, in touch. Um, and so that, that's been truly, truly astonishing. And then there are a lot of former sort of co-workers, some you liked and some you didn't, who <laughs> find you on Facebook. <laughs> yes? The refugees 
that came from Belgium, were they based on any uh, historical facts? That oh, absolutely, did? yes. This was one of the uh, inspirations for another essay by Henry James in the same book. It's called Within the Rim. It's uh, essays that he wrote in 1914 and 15. Um, he was very involved in Belgian war relief. Mm -hmm. There was something like six million Belgians displaced by the marauding German army. It was the first time a Ger an army had terrorized the civilian population inside Europe, except the Turks, is what everybody said, you know, can't count the Turks, but uh, nobody was used to this sort of warfare where people were driven out of their homes, people were shot in the streets, people were used as human shields on bridges, and there was this huge wave of humanity was trying to escape um, the oncoming army, and Britain took in 250,000 refugees, and they fed them and housed them and took care of them for the four years of the war, all through private charitable subscription in towns and villages all over England. And I had never heard this story. It wasn't in any of the history books that uh, I had read in school, and it seemed to be forgotten. And when I was writing it, I had no idea that refugees you know, would become such a current topic. Um, but I thought it was an amazing example of you know, good-hearted good people doing their best British people like that, and it turned out to be, I hope, you know, a somewhat timely reminder. Um, but yes, the, it was amazing. Now, towards the end of the war, there was also some of the rhetoric you hear now, and it was like, well, how come they're getting free house, and oh, I've just been kicked out of mine, how come I don't have a job? And this question of, well, if you don't let them work, you have to take care of them, they're getting money for nothing. If you do let them work, they're taking out jobs. And it did get bad to the point where Agatha Christie decided to do something about this and improve their image, and so she created this minor character called Hercule Poirot. Oh. And Hercule Poirot was a Belgian refugee. Um, so really interesting, the, the parallels with today. But yes, I thought it was a magnificent effort that we managed to, to house all these people. And so the Belgian refugees came to Rye. And again, I'd never heard of that, but it was in the Henry James essay. Um, and so there's a great scene, I think, where the Belgian refugees arrive, and all the ladies want re refugees, but I think it's the mayor's wife who says, well, our ladies can't be expected to take in the absolute peasants, even though they look so lovely in their wooden clogs. <laughs> <laughs> and meanwhile, there's some small, beribboned girl with a basket of shortbread sort of throwing shortbread at all these poor refugees who are just totally dazed, um, which I think we would do today exactly the same. <laughs> yeah. What are you working on now, if anything? Yes, well, I've been saying, well, I have six or seven pages of my third novel, but it's been a few months since I've had time to touch it. And when I went back this week to look, I have two pages, <laughs> and it's been a year. <laughs> But I've also decided not to, not, I can't talk about it because the more I talk, the less I write. And the more I try to describe it to people, the sillier it sounds. And <laughs> writers suffer with self-doubt. Um, I've discovered it's not just me, but I suffer with almost crippling self-doubt despite two books under my belt. Um, and so if I explain it to someone and they frown, I'm just devastated right. because you know, my writing life is over. So better that I put my little butt in the chair get it written. Mm -hmm. Yes? Could you explain Seated Below the Soul? Oh, <laughs> well, maybe, but I am a sort of lower middle class person, so not very well. Yes, at a long dinner table, if you're aristocracy in, in England, you are seated in order of precedence. So royalty at the head of the table, followed by um, dukes and duchesses and earls and baronets. Um, and if you're any kind of commoner, you come below any kind of minor aristocracy. So the smallest baronet is seated nearer the head of the table. And so I guess the salt and pepper are somewhere in the middle. So seated below the salt means that you're down at the sort of lower end of the table. And everybody knows it. That's how I seat all my Hamptons dinner parties. <laughs> 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 but um, yes, that's one aspect of the class system that we don't really have here, though.
people ask me all the time, it's like, oh, those British and their class system. We totally have a class system here. It's like as soon as the pilgrims arrive to escape the class system and religious persecution, they set about setting one up. You know, so we still, you know, we have our private clubs and we have our little, the ways that we organize and segregate ourselves. Um, that's all class, basically. So, um, it's refreshing. I mean, it's definitely looser in America, and it's, you can definitely sort of buy your way in. But, uh, but you could tell me more about that, because you're all from Southampton. I'm from West Hampton, which is kind of below the salt. <laughs> Are there any major Pettigrew questions? I'm more than happy to talk about the major. Yes? I do have a question. Uh, in the light of the Brexit vote, uh, uh, and what you said about immigra immigrants being assimilated in Rye, would you have voted for Brexit? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Personal question? <laughs> um, yeah, I had dinner with uh, my sister and her family. They still live in Rye. My parents have had absconded to France. Oh, let's start with my parents live in France. So for them, a Brexit vote throws their life into uncertainty because right now they get their pension from England and they get full health benefits as full reciprocity and freedom of movement. Um, and also their savings have now diminished because the pound has tumbled. Um, so there are real consequences to my family. I had dinner with my sister and her two of her three sons and their wives and girlfriends. And we're sort of a family split down the middle and this is apparently common. Uh, in the UK, so I would definitely be a Remainer. My parents are Remainers, and my oldest nephew, who works for an international motor company, uh, I believe his company told them to vote Remain. But, <laughs> but his job depends on you know exports to Europe. I would think personally his job's under threat. My sister and my other nephews who are in the British Navy all voted to leave, um, and then they're good people, and they're not really they're not racist. But they really bought into this idea of sovereignty, that we need to get our sovereignty back, we need to be our accepted aisle, we need to make our own decisions. Um, and I don't blame them because we got into, the, into Europe in the 70s and my whole life, every politician who wanted to score a quick point would sort of make a joke about the bureaucrats in Brussels. So every party, even those who are staunchly remain, had no problem bashing Europe whenever they could, could use it to their advantage. Um, you know, and David Cameron wanted to remain, but in order to secure his own position as leader of the party, he allowed this referendum in the first place. So you can't really blame the sort of ordinary people um, for, for follow, following their politicians. But uh, it's going to be interesting. I mean, it, I think it's actually quite hideous, because if the British are swept away by this sort of new nationalism, then we won't have any right to object when the Latvians and the Hungarians and all want to do the same thing. And I believe we've had two world wars over those kind of issues, all starting in Europe. So so if you, if you have another hour, we could talk about this further. <laughs> but the, let's just say the conversation was very careful around the dinner table. I was very careful. But then when we got onto other subjects, like um, you know um, the British in the Olympics and, and getting getting stuff they need, and several times I found myself able to say, hmm, so you do you think if we got together and worked together as a block, we would get better results? <laughs> and everybody would sort of squint at me. But um, yes, it's really I'm fascinating times. David Cameron just resigned, and Theresa May is the new Prime Minister without a vote at all. That's democracy in Britain. <laughs> so I can't really explain it myself. Um, so, so it is possible that if they called a general election, which they don't have to do, but they could do. They called a general election and the Labour Party wanted to vote on Remain, then what do you do if the Labour Party gets in? So I don't think we've heard the last of the story. So thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. That was just a wonderful, wonderful talk, and I'm sure those of us who haven't read the book or finished it will rush out to the library or the bookstore. Um, before we end, I just wanted to mention a couple of, while we have all of you here and you obviously love reading, I just want to mention that we have a little postcard in the back with the upcoming authors. 
And um, there's a woman named Maureen Sherry who wrote a really fantastic book about women in Wall Street. And she was a managing partner of a big Wall Street firm. She's coming in August. And um, a woman who wrote a really absolutely great book that you might not think you'd be interested in, and that's what I thought when I started the book. It's about how we present ourselves. This woman is an international consultant, and she wrote a book called How to Wow or something. And I have to say, I opened the book thinking, mm -hmm. you know, okay, we'll have her, but not excited. But she wrote this wonderful book, and she will be here in a week. Um, famous guy who wrote, just a, those of you who like Nathan's, this fellow wrote a book about his uh, father. No, Grant, I guess it must be his grandfather. It's either his grandfather or his father was the guy who started Nathan's. That's kind of a really cool immigrant tale. This will be controversial. Ralph Peters, Fox News analyst, military analyst, will be here to talk about his book about the Civil War. But believe me, he will probably get into other subjects. <laughs> he will. And a woman from Scotland who wrote a book, Samantha Bruce Benjamin, will be at the Historical Museum at a, pro at a program co-sponsored by us. So just wanted to mention that. But today was just our great, great event. And I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you all for coming. Thanks again. Thank you.